Um, so yeah, I'm Kath and I work at GitHub and I am, um, I, I head up the docs team at GitHub and we've done a ton of stuff this year. One of the most exciting things is that we open sourced GitHub's documentation and that's what this talk is all about. Uh, we, we've done a whole bunch of other things and so I'm happy to talk about those, those things too. And we have some more stuff planned that I think is really cool and interesting just for docs in general, technical writing in general. Um, but for this talk, what I really want to, to focus on are these goals. So um, I wanna you know get to know I want you all to get to know why we open sourced the GitHub documentation. And if you've ever worked on open source GitHub documentation, you probably already know the answer to this. Um, learn how to make contributions to GitHub docs yourselves and then discover where we're taking docs and hopefully kind of feel a little inspired by what we're, what we're all doing. So what we're, what we're really focusing on this year at GitHub is this concept of taking documentation from this static experience where you have a bunch of content on a screen, a bunch of text on a screen that you're interacting with, but really like the interaction is happening when you're going from, from one tab to what your, what your tool is that you're trying to work on. So you're going from the GitHub documentation to github.com and you're kind of bouncing back and forth, searching for things, et cetera. It's still kind of this like one way experience where you're consuming content and then putting it into, you know, whatever you're trying to learn. And what we're doing at GitHub right now is really starting to turn documentation into an interface for code. And github.com is a platform for developers. And so we're really embracing that and trying to, to think about and put ourselves in, in the shoes of a developer and what they need from their technical documentation. And a lot of that, you know, is this con this idea that like you really want to answer their questions. And in order to do that, in order to kind of really get into this place where people are really learning and saturating their themselves with the docs and the content, you have to create this immersive experience. And so that's really what we're focused focused on there. And docs really shouldn't be static. We should be able to have these interactive experiences, videos, um, we should be able to have code examples, et cetera, that really pull people into the documentation and allow them to start using it. And we're talking about things too on docs, like introducing discussion forums on our docs so people can ask and answer questions of each other, especially you know, during the pandemic, I can't turn to my colleague to my left uh, sitting in an office and ask them a question. So I, I turn to the internet a lot. And that means that I'm gonna end up on some sites, like if I Google something about, about GitHub, I might end up on Stack Overflow or Quora or somewhere where I get an, an answer to my question, but it might be out of date, or it might be from somebody who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing um, or gives me some kind of inaccurate information. And so we really want to, make that experience one where we're kind of capturing that within the documentation itself and uh, governing it a little bit and guiding that conversation a little bit. We're also talking about adding things like uh, a, a sandbox IDE experience that will let people um, that will let people interact with the code examples and start to play with them themselves and see things working, see things running, um, see the the code actually executing right there within the docs before they take it to their project. And so they kind of learn through that example. And the next one. And really what this is all about for us is connecting all of these developers together. So it's broadening that conversation about what it means to really truly understand a piece of technical documentation. And one of the coolest things here is that once you get to this place where you know you're asking people a question questions in many different ways you're figuring things out yourself you're watching somebody walk through a video you're starting to get to this place where you're learning about whatever tool this is from from so many different places i know i learn in like 15 different ways <laughs> everybody's always like everybody learns in a different way everybody learns in multiple different ways and so we want to provide all of those tools to the community and that means welcoming the community in. And our main goal 
is to get developers to that aha moment, that magical moment when you're like, oh, I get it. I answered my question and I can see it working in my code and I know why it's working in my code. And now I can either go and answer other people's questions or I can do a demo. You feel so much more empowered in that moment. And it's all about, for us, it's all about connecting this community together through the documentation. So last October, we open sourced GitHub documentation. And it was this, it was this funny moment where I think it was, we had been working on this for a little over a year and a lot of, a lot of the really amazing thought went into this um, from, if you know GitHub documentation, the team, you probably have heard of Zeke. He, he's put a ton of work into this leading up to this moment. And then in July, when I joined the team, I'm a, I'm a product manager. And so I said, well, let's do it in three months. <laughs> and we, um, when the team accepted the challenge, they were like, okay, let's do it. And so we kind of put the gas on the project and we pulled it off. We um, shipped it for Oktoberfest. And this is an image of when, I don't know how many people know this, but when you take a project from a private project to a public one, we have a Slack integration that is like this little celebratory moment. So this is a picture of, um, and the person you're seeing on here too is our one of our security engineers who actually flipped the switch for us because we're part of the GitHub organization. Um, this is Mona celebrating that our repository is now public. And we told everybody we're going live at 9 a.m. This is 8.59 a.m. We actually went live. And so it was pretty fun. Um, you can see some people were starting to react to it. Uh, but yeah, this is like the culmination of a lot of hard work across the docs team. And at this moment, then it meant that we could expand the documentation team to beyond 14 writers and a handful of engineers to the entire community. And one of the awesome things about that is um, this story that I'm gonna walk you through. So one of the things I love about working with the community is that, you know, we were 14 writers and we're adding more all the time. And we're seven engineers, two product managers, a designer, myself, um, and that's probably a pretty big team for a documentation um, for something like GitHub. But it's a small team when you think about the scale and the, and the breadth of what GitHub is and all of the different tools and all of the different languages and all of the different things developers need and things we need to pay attention to as a documentation team. So one of those things is, you know, I would be lying to you if I said we had a PowerShell developer on the GitHub documentation team. We don't, we don't, a lot of us don't know anything about PowerShell, but our users know a lot about PowerShell and they need a guide to help them with building and testing PowerShell specifically for GitHub Actions for CI CD. So we do have a lot of folks on the team who know CI CD, who can review content like this, but we don't have experts. And one of the coolest things about opening this up to the community is that we can start to plug those gaps in our documentation to fulfill the need of more developers. And so this is actually a, an article that one of our content, um, one of our community members wrote, her name's Chrissy Lamar, and she is an open source maintainer for DBA tools and knows a ton about PowerShell. So as soon as we opened source, I think it was that morning, she reached out to me and said, hey, I wanna write this, I wanna write this PowerShell um, guide. And I was like, oh, cool, yeah, we'll totally do that. And then I turned around to the team and I was like, okay, Chrissy wants to write this PowerShell guide. And it was the first time that we had a contributor from outside our team out and outside of GitHub create content at this scale. And so we knew we had to kind of then, you know, like go back and forth with her on what the content strategy was, what the um, what the styles were and review the work. And we figured it out and we got this PowerShell guide shipped, um, I think like a week or so later and we're able to put her name on it. And, and it's been really great. It's one of, I think people started using it even while it was in a PR before it was even merged into the main branch and published to our page. So we, we knew people really wanted this kind of thing. So we'll do more of this and invite more people in to contribute in various different ways. 
um, on various different things that folks really know about. So um, this is our, uh, this is docs.github.com, our open source repository for, um, for, for docs.github.com. And this is an old screenshot, but uh, right off the bat, it was pretty, it was, it was more popular than I thought it was going to be. The lead maintainer, her name's Janice on this project. She was like, Kath, I told you so. <laughs> I told you this is going to be really popular. Um, and she was totally right. And we've got a lot of really, really cool engagement. We've got a lot of cool, cool contributors and a great community around this talking about documentation. So it's pretty fun to see. So I just want to walk through a quick demo too of how to easily contribute. And this is an animated GIF. Before I hit the next button, I just want to um, kind of explain why it was important to us to build this. Um, the, the, our documentation is written in, all of the content is in Markdown using liquid rendering, and it's a Node.js application. And it's all hosted on uh, github.com slash github slash docs. The actual code and the content lives together in that repository. So if you're contributing to anything, you go to that repository and open up an issue or open up a, a pull request. And it can be a little daunting to find the, the um, piece of content that you would like to update or the piece of code that you would like to update. So what we did was we actually uh, put a link, and this is, this is not something, we're not the only ones to do this. A lot of open source projects, particularly in documentation, do something like this where they will link directly to either the page that you wanna to contribute to or the code that you wanna to contribute to or the repository in general. So I'm just gonna click through on this animated GIF. So down here you see a make a contribution button. And as soon as I click that, it's going to actually take me to the GitHub edit screen where you can edit that piece of content. So it navigates directly into, and I'll let this play a, a couple of times, it navigates directly into that repository and opens up that file in the GitHub edit mode. And so you can make a contribution right here. You can also do things like clone the repository, run it locally, and see all of the content, all of the code and everything. And you can fork it, you can turn it into your own entirely new site if you want. But we really wanted to make this, create this on, onboarding experience where it was super simple. If you see something like a typo or you're like, I think this, um, I think this piece of content could be better served in a different way. You can really easily just click make a contribution and then go and do that. And then after this, you, you make your change and then you're in the GitHub workflow where you save it, you open a pull request, we'll get somebody from our from the GitHub writing team to review it, work with you on any, any changes or feedback, and then merge it in and you're a contributor. So this, um, I, as I, I mentioned before, it took us over a year to get here. And, um, and the last haul was, we did a lot, a lot of work and it was not easy. Uh, so I just wanna kind of walk through what really made this hard. And um, one of the things that we have to do at GitHub is we have to work in public and in private at the same time. And that is because we do have things that we're documenting that are have not been released yet, and um, and and so we're kind of working on them and documenting them up until the day that we launch, and then we'll make them public. We'll publish them to the main branch in our in our public repository. So what we've done instead of publishing and working on everything in public, there is kind there does kind of have to be this um, this double sidedness to the documentation to handle this kind of thing, so that we can support our go to market teams. So what we've done is we actually built a GitHub action and GitHub actions are, um, they are workflows that you can run on your repository that basically stitch together different events and run off of each other. So it's like a way to automate your, your workflow or your tooling. A lot of it is, a lot of GitHub actions is used for um, continuous integration and continuous delivery type of things. So what we did is we built one of those that basically says, for any PR that is merged into the main branch, we are going to uh, 
replicate that uh, from a private repository to a public repository. So we, we work in two different repos, docs-internal and docs. And, the, and slash docs is our public one. And so we don't sync anything that's related to discussions or issues or wikis or things like that. We only sync pull requests that have been merged into the main branch. And that's a bi-directional mirror. So the, the two repositories are always in sync with each other every 15 minutes. So that's how we solved that one. The next one that has been really difficult is actually our CI CD workflow. And we're continuing to work on this. So we use um, GitHub docs. I think we have about 50 GitHub actions. Um, and I know Lucas is on the call, he'll keep me honest. <laughs> Um, and we use a lot of those to check tests, things like we'll run, um, we'll, we'll run link checkers, we'll run all sorts of tests to make sure that um, our, our docs are going to be running smoothly as soon as they hit production. And these tests can take a really long time. I think um, from the time that I wrote this uh, presentation, they were taking about eight minutes to run. And one of the problems with that is we actually, um, when you when you hit, when you finish your pull request, you open your pull request, all of these checks will run and it prevents you from merging your pull request into the master branch until those tests are done. So what you end up doing as a developer is sitting there and watching your screen for eight minutes while these tests go through. And sometimes they fail, some, sometimes they, all, of them, um, all of them turn green and they go and then you can hit merge. And that's a lot of time wasted if you're a developer. So one of the things that we've done recently is we've actually added the capability of auto merge. And so if your tests always pass, then you can actually auto merge uh, your PR and you don't have to sit around and wait for it to go. Um, we're also working on making our tests a lot faster. So I think um, I mentioned it was like eight minutes from the time I wrote these slides. I think we've gotten it down to five or six minutes, which is pretty decent, um, especially with the auto merge feature, which has been really nice. And then the last thing that has make, made this really hard is working with translations. So we translate into five different languages at GitHub and we're, we're looking to add a lot more. And Right now, we don't have a way to accept open source translations. We work with Crowdin. I'm sure a lot of folks on this call probably are familiar with Crowdin. And um, Crowdin does have open source and accepts open source translations. So what we want to do, <laughs> yeah, thanks, pull request, PR. Um, what we want to do is work with Crowdin on integrating that into, um, into our public repository so that we can actually accept translations and test them within our public repository and not have to work through Crowdin. So the way Crowdin works is they are they monitor our site and every time there's new content, they'll basically manage that project to translate, to crowd, crowd translate all of the document, all of the content. And so every time we have ship anything new or update any piece of content, that gets updated in all five of our languages. So it's basically an agile project management for, for translations. And so we want to be able to do that directly within the open source community. We can't do that yet. It's coming probably um, in the second half of this year. So there are three main pathways to contribution um, on the GitHub docs. And so there's small fixes, like if you see a, um, a typo or something just seems inconsistent, um, those are really easy to do, especially with that um, make a contribution button. There's also curated issues. So we will, we, the docs content team, the 14 writers that I talked about, they will actually open up issues on our open public repository to um, that are kind of a little bit easier for somebody to do. And I say easier because um, they, don't, they don't introduce a lot of challenges with working with our styles, working with our content. That can be a little bit daunting. So we do have some stuff on there that is a little bit more complicated, but we'll put those on there um, so that people can get a little bit of a flavor of working on something a little bit more complex. 
And then we have entire articles or guides. And so that's similar to the one that I mentioned before that um, Chrissy Lamar did. And so this is, we're rolling out a project or a program really to be able to take on more guides that are from the community that mimic what, what Chrissy was able to do. So not only from the community, but also from third party integrators and things like that, we're adding a lot more capability to add to, for people to come and contribute wholesale articles and guides like that. And um, we're also drawing on, I think this is an animated gift too. We're also drawing on some other parts of the community. So on our GitHub Actions page, we have these code examples. And on these code examples, the, one of these are really great for getting people just up and running with whatever uh, feature they're using. And right now um, I'm showing you the GitHub Actions one. So if I search for, um, actually the chat, the chat window is hiding it, so I don't know what I'm, okay. So if I'm searching for issues right now, I can see all of those. I search for pizza. I don't know, <laughs> we don't have any code examples for pizza. And so I can click on learn how to add one um, myself. And then that takes me to the uh, JSON file where I can actually add um, a code example for pizza if I really wanted to. And what's cool about this is we're actually drawing, the database set for this is from the community itself. And so this uses Sarah Dresner, who is a developer advocate at Microsoft. She put together a, an awesome list, which is basically awesome lists are like lists of cool projects that are on github.com. And she put one together that is just about, uh, just about GitHub Actions. And so we're actually able, and it's all public content, we're actually able to pull in that content into our docs and it's all community sourced. So we have not only um, community contributed content like, the, like Chrissy's uh, guide, but we also have community uh, contributed content like these GitHub Actions. So if you wanted to get started, if you wanted to contribute, you would go to github.com slash github slash docs, or you could just go to docs.github.com and click the make a contribution button. We really encourage you to open up an issue or pick one, um, pick one up or open up a PR. We have folks, um, everybody on the writing team is a, is a, uh, a maintainer. And so what's cool is they'll reach out and they'll just say, hey, you know, what are you trying to do with this? Um, we'll work with you on, um, on whatever issue or whatever idea you have. We also use discussions, GitHub discussions, to um, just have a conversation about anything you want. It can be from like, I don't know, talking about your cats to talking about GitHub documentation. Um, and that's where we do a lot of our community outreach to. Um, and so we have like a welcome thread there and we'll talk about all kinds of things in our discussions. And then you can also just ping me. I think I'm in the right the docs community. I'm also, um, I talk about a lot a lot of really random stuff on Twitter. <laughs> and so you can reach out, I'm Simsoka on Twitter. Um, if you have any questions or like want to get started on something or want some advice on open sourcing documentation. And I think that's it. I'm not sure how long I went, but um, I can also answer any questions. I wasn't really paying too much attention to the chat, but if there are questions in there, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, no, the, the, thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I definitely feel like kind of blown away uh, seeing uh, that integration. Um, and I definitely saw a bunch of excitement in the chat. Um, you've got, uh, so if, uh, if you have a question, um, please uh, feel free to put in the chat. Uh, we're trying to limit the cacophony of a bunch of people talking uh, all at once, um, but we'll go ahead and uh, get people uh, set up. And while people are uh, I think you're typing. Uh, so I've got one question. So, so Kath, you have this, this was, this looked intense to put together. And is there like one lesson that you got from this that you wish you could tell your past self before starting this thing? Yeah. This is, it, it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, 
the there were a couple of things we launched with Hacktoberfest, and um, I think that is a very good uh, launching with like a, an existing campaign is a really good idea. Um, there were some hiccups with Hacktoberfest this year. I think um, if you were if you were following it, Hacktoberfest is for those who don't know, Hacktoberfest is a um, it's a it's a festival a virtual festival that happens. It's always virtual. It happens in October, it's put on by this company called DigitalOcean. And it is basically a bug bash that's all about open source. And one of the, it's a little controversial because it does get a lot of, of contributors who are very new and they are very swag driven contributors. And so you get participants and companies that will say like, we'll give you a t-shirt or we'll give you a water bottle or whatever if you contribute to a certain amount of open source. And I think the, the intention was in the right place at the beginning when this all started, but it has kind of turned into a swag fest, which can drive the wrong incentives. And so when we were putting together our, our launch plan, we were kind of thinking, you know, should we actually do this? Do we want to contribute to like maintainer overhead and that kind of thing? And we decided we did want to. And I think going into that, um, I would have liked to have planned it a little bit better with DigitalOcean because um, we, we want to foster a lot of really good community engagement, not good swag engagements. <laughs> um, so I think that's probably that's probably the, the one lesson I learned um, regarding the launch. Uh, the other one I kind of knew going into this, which was, you know, if I, which is why I, I kind of put the gas on the project um, to speed it up. I think if I had started this project with the team um, when they started it, I probably would have pushed to move a lot faster. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we did push to move faster in the end. I think you can figure out a lot more. You can like test things. It's okay to be wrong. You can throw things out there. Um, and I think we ended up pulling it off and changing our minds and, and doing things that were kind of wild in the end. But I think it, it really helped us just get the whole entire concept out there for folks, which was really nice. So I always say move faster. <laughs> I can see that and that, that that sort of sense of like fail fast so you can recover uh, probably alongside that. Um, at least yeah. that, that's what people, uh, that's what I always keep hearing. Uh, um, so we got some great questions coming in. Uh, so I'll start with Carolyn to ask, uh, how do you contribute maintenance of user contributed guides? Maintenance of so user. Like, how, yeah, how do you handle yeah. the maintenance of user contributed guides? Yeah. Yeah, so that's one thing that we have to figure out. I don't have a real solid answer for that yet. And that's why we haven't really been promoting a lot of user contributed guides. One of the things we're working on right now is actually working with our integrators to, to um, contribute integration guides. And so we have this thing at GitHub called the partner program. And our integrators, if you have like an actual integration with GitHub, not just like GitHub sort of works with our partner with our third party tool, then we're exploring a way for that integrator to actually write guides and write content on our docs. And one of the things that um, that we're doing is baking in maintenance and supportability that is actually puts that on the integrator themselves, on the author themselves. And so it's kind of like once you once you take that leap and you're saying I'm going to be an author of this piece of documentation, you're also signing up to maintain that piece of documentation and participate with us and answer questions um, in the community. So you are a contributor, but you have like a certain um, a certain responsibility at that point. And so we're playing around with what that looks like because it is it if we were to kind of open the floodgates it would be unsustainable for our documentation team to maintain documents that have been written by people in the community when we don't have the expertise on staff to be able to, to do that. And so you're kind of signing up for signing up for the long run. Cool. We've, we've got one question here that's been, uh, uh, it's been like upvoted a couple times uh, from Eric is, uh, have you thought about any GitHub action tasks that check for uh, unreleased products accidentally going into the public docs? 
And do you have any other interesting linters? Yeah, um, we're actually building some interesting linters right now to help us with some of our spam issues. Um, but we do check for a lot of different things. We check to see if, um, if you are <laughs> um, somebody on the GitHub staff and you really should be contributing something to our docs internal repository and not our docs public repository. We, we have a lot of warnings and things too, but we check to make sure that, that you know what you're doing. And it's not necessarily you know what you're doing, it's that you know that you're working in public versus working in private, um, just in case you release any proprietary information or spill the beans early on a ship or something like that. Um, and then we also have, um, we have, let's see, I had one in my head that I was gonna mention that was really, really cool, but now it's totally slipping me, but maybe I'll, I'll come back to it. I mentioned spam. So we've got um, some interesting spam that we're trying to navigate on our public repository. And it's kind of no secret that, um, that it's out there and we're working as hard and fast as we can to mitigate a lot of this. And one of the things that we're doing is picking up on any kind of, um, any kind of, uh, of pattern. And we're building a GitHub action to actually, we're actually building a linter to pick, to, um, to like try and uh, hit, hit, remove that spam before it goes into anybody's notification. And because one of the things that is really frustrating with spam and open source is that it, you can actually blast a lot of people with notifications and that's not fun. And what that results in for us is people who don't wanna come back and contribute again. And so we're taking this super, super seriously and trying to mitigate that for folks, but do it in a way that's automated. Um, so we're trying to kind of combine those. We have other linters which will look for like duplicate images or um, we have checks for images and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, I feel like like a, a future talk on combating uh, like that the spam at that sort of level would also be probably fascinating to a lot of people here. Uh, yeah. That's just a mild hint. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a funny scale. That would be a funny, that would, it's an interesting one to do because I don't want to put a lot of ideas about how to spam us. <laughs> right, right, right. That's a, the, yeah, that's that delicate thing of here's the ways in which we're combating this. Please don't abuse it. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Right. I, I do security writing. I have the same sort of problem. Uh, yeah. uh, so we got two questions that I'm going to merge together. Um, so one is a question about uh, the size of the team mm -hmm. uh, the developing this. Is what's the smallest size team you could picture carrying out this project? And along with that, at another question. So that one was from Liz and from Susan. Just uh, can you tell us what those seven engineers on your team are responsible for? Yeah. So the smallest project. So I I would say. Um, if you wanted to do this with a really lean and mean team, you could totally get away with it with like two or three people. Um, but they would get pretty tired working at the scale that we're working at um, on, on GitHub Docs. And part of that is because um, our, you, you want somebody to be a lead maintainer and to own a lot of the con contribution docs and a lot of the direction. You also want somebody who can triage and who is not necessarily like just triaging spam and things like that that come in, but knows how to route re PR review and how to answer um, issues and things like that. I think you could probably get away with it for a little while with two people, but it quickly becomes a little unwieldy when you have a lot of PRs coming in. Um, and, and at that point, you'd probably want to start relying more on the community. Um, we are lucky that we have the team, a team the, si the size that we are, and we can rely on <clears throat> a lot of the uh, content writers to do some of these reviews and interact with the community. It is also really fun to interact with the community. So um, a lot of the content writers and myself too find ourselves going down the rabbit hole and like spending way too much time <laughs> in in the community and reviewing PRs and things like that. But I think you could probably pull it off with two people. I I bet um, Lucas who works on the team is rolling his eyes at me. <laughs> You'd quickly have to um, have to add more folks though as you scale. And then the engineers on the team. So they work on, I mentioned this is, um, all of our content is in Markdown and using liquid rendering and 
um, the application itself is Node.js. Right now, we're moving to make the, uh, the application a lot more interactive and immersive. So we are adding um, React components into the application itself. So if you go to docs.github.com slash actions, you're gonna see that that page is a lot different than docs.github.com slash enterprise, for example. So we're reformatting a lot of the layout of our documentation to be a little bit more of a guide and pull people into the content itself. So you'll see things like guides, you'll see popular articles, you'll see a what's new section, which is kind of a, um, a product change log that's, it's a, that's product specific on there. And then you'll see the, um, the uh, code examples and things like all docs. If you click on all guides, then you'll be taken into experience that has a lot of learning paths. And those learning paths are, they're, they're exactly what they sound like. They take you through a bunch of different articles and you're gonna learn a whole set of things that pertain to whatever product you're looking at. And so this, our engineering team is supporting the work to actually build that out and also supporting the existing application at the same time. So it's a lot. They do things like get us off fastly and make sure that Heroku is running okay and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that does sound like a lot. Um, uh, and uh, and so I mean, speaking of a lot too, there's some really great questions in here. I think we'll wrap up with one more that got an upvote, uh, and then perhaps uh, if there are any follow-ups. Maybe you can field them on Twitter or or something like that. Does that work for you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm also in, if y'all are in the Slack channel, I'm in there too, so you can ping me. Um, the So the last one here we've got from Margaret, which is, uh, how do you manage content that's shared between GitHub Docs and GitHub Enterprise Docs? Um, or are Enterprise Docs separate from, uh, or are they a separate project? So we actually, Lucas started to answer some of this um, using Liquid for versioning. Um, our GitHub Enterprise Docs, all of that content sits within Docs, um, the within the Docs repository. But one of the things we do is um, we maintain GitHub Enterprise versions back a year. So we'll have like GitHub Enterprise 2.0, 2.2, et cetera. And we have uh, we have enterprise um, customers who will need, you know, they won't upgrade for quite a while to the newest thing. Um, and I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with that kind of um, mentality. So we need to be able to, uh, because we have, we have features that we have either not released for certain releases that are, um, that are later on, or they are augmented in a certain way, we need to be able to maintain all of those versions. And I can't really speak to the technical details about how all of this stuff is versioned, but we do version every single one of our supported enterprise releases. And there's a place on the site where customers can actually flip between versions. And it's in the upper right. I can actually probably show you. Well, I'm only sharing part of my screen. <laughs> um, it's if you go to any any of our docs pages, you'll see a toggle in the upper upper right that'll allow you to actually switch between enterprise versions. And what's that that's doing is it's changing the entire doc site to be able to surface those features that are for that um, enterprise release. And we maintain this content back to when the latest the latest or the 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 oldest release that we support, which is probably from about a year. I think it's about a year ago. So that's how we maintain those two different worlds. Great, and, and I'm sure a lot of people probably have various follow-up questions too. So yeah, like we'll, um, uh, for those who aren't uh, in the Write the Doc Slack, uh, you can pretty much find out all sorts of things about our great community at writethedocs.org. Uh, and participate in the great discussions there. I think that with that, um, let's go ahead and we can send uh, Cap off with another like Zoom set of jazz hands. It's again, clapping is kind of weird when it's only you.